So if any of you know me, you know that I don't like mornings. I hate him. I'm not a morning person. He's nodding his head. He knows. As a matter of fact, I'm going to share with you a very private photo of me as a young man hating mornings. Look, look at this guy. Look how, look how upset he is to be awake. I was mad. I hate mornings to this day. Like when I wake up, I need to gradually make that happen. I can't just get up and start going right away. Look, to me, there's nothing more offensive than waking up and being flooded with light. I hate that. And Shelly does that all the time to me. She'll wake up and just like flick the light on. We got bright LEDs, right, in the bedroom. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, what's wrong with you people that do that? I need to sit in the dark for a bit and let the light slowly but surely come in and then I adjust and I'm not so offended. But here's the thing. Jesus says he's the light of the world. And we know that, we, that this world is, is, is the dwelling in like a deep darkness. So, so what can we expect when the light comes into the darkness? It's very, very offensive or it could be perceived that way. And that's exactly what we see in the ministry of Jesus. The light of the world intruded into our dark rooms and he shone with this intense light that caused the world to just lash out in a rage. They, they killed him. But we shouldn't be offended by this light because this light is our only hope of salvation. It's our only hope. There's no hope, no salvation outside the light of Jesus Christ. There's no other way to God. This is it. And this message is offensive to the progressive culture. To say Jesus is the only way, it's offensive. Like at Street Help this Friday, uh, we were talking about John chapter 1, and a woman said, Jesus can't be the only way. Come on. What about, what about the genderless aliens? Genderless aliens? What, you mean like angels? Like what are you talking about? No, it's offensive to say Jesus is the only only exclusive way he's the light of the world he's the only way to god and so to set the scene up jesus is standing in the temple again and this is what he says verse um, 12 of chapter 8 all the way to verse 18 again jesus spoke to them saying i am the light of the world whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life so the pharisees said to him you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. So, Jesus goes into the temple again. Now, this is important to note here because as we're going through the book of John, we're discovering whenever he goes into the temple, he offends a lot of people. And they get really upset at Jesus. But he goes again. Despite the opposition, he's not backing down, he's not a pushover, he's not a wimp. So he goes to the temple, and this is how he starts his sermon. He stands up and he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So, this is a very outlandish claim he makes about himself. He says, I'm the light of the world, and the implication is this. If you don't follow me, you are therefore walking in darkness and abiding in death. Well, come on, that's kind of offensive. Jesus is basically saying, if you don't follow me, you're the walking dead. What Jesus is doing here is he's setting himself up as the only exclusive means of salvation and truth, which in our progressive relativistic culture is severe blasphemy. Severe blasphemy. You go on CNN with this sort of message, you're done. You're ousted. 
Has anybody ever seen this bumper sticker before? <laughs> you need a bucket back there? <laughs> yeah, you guys, have, you guys are familiar with this image, coexist. Pretty much sums up how the great majority of North Americans view truth. This image sums it up perfectly. Each letter is a different symbol of a religion or philosophy. So the C represents like Islam. The O is the peace symbol, which has all sorts of connotations to it. Uh, the E has actually just recently become offensive because there's only two genders represented. <laughs> so there's male and, f male and female. So they need to revise the coexist image, I think, because <laughs> it's quite offensive. Yeah. It, it's, I'm offended, frankly. Um, the, uh, the X is the star of David, David, you know, represents Judaism. The I, yeah, the I, I think, is Satanism, <laughs> looks like, science. or science or something, I don't know. The S is something, yin and, yang. yin and yang, but there's a, yeah, I guess. And then the T represents the cross, which is supposed to represent uh, Christianity. So, when you look at this image, ask yourself, what does it imply? What is this image implying? What is it saying? Everyone is welcome, right? Everyone is welcome. Uh, everything's cool. Doesn't matter. Uh, what is it preaching? Look, when I see this, this is what I see. All these very different philosophies, not one of these two agree on like anything really. All these very different things, truth claims, are equal coexist. They're equal on the same level. Everyone's welcome. And yes, everyone is also right. Your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. It's like when people say, I get this all the time, no, no, I'm not going to hell because I don't believe in the God of the Bible. Oh, is, it that, is, that, is, that, is that simple? Just don't believe and there's no justice or anything? Look, it doesn't matter what you believe the truth doesn't conform to you. If you believe something that's false, the truth isn't going to say, oh, oh no, I don't want to offend you, so let me conform. No, the truth doesn't care. The truth is offensive. Unless you're in line with it, then it's your best friend. Just be, and we had this as Tree Help again. Somebody was talking about reincarnation. If you believe reincarnation is true, it doesn't mean you're going to wake up as a butterfly. They're not all equal. And they're not all true. There is a truth, and the truth is better and superior to the lies. I don't care what Oprah tells you. Right, Ben? <laughs> so Jesus stands up in the temple, and he tells us in the passage, I'm the light of the world. If you don't follow me, you follow death. Jesus is not inclusive. Jesus is not progressive or as I call it, regressive. He actually is progressive in the, in the right understanding of the word. He's exclusive, and he's not ashamed to say it. That's how he starts the sermon. He starts off, he goes in the temple, he says, I am the only way. I am the light. I am the life. It's me, period. No one else. But the Pharisees deny his testimony about himself, and they say, look, you're just exalting yourself. You're testifying about yourself. Therefore, your testimony is not true. You can't just come on the scene and say, I'm this or I'm that. You need, like, some credible witnesses. They're telling Jesus that his, his words are false because he's speaking about himself. They're saying, your truth is not our truth because it doesn't fit our religious box. It doesn't fit into our coexist box. Jesus doesn't back down, though. He just stands on the truth boldly. His testimony about himself is true. And even, and even if he was just saying it about himself, even if that was the case, it would still be true. But it's not just his testimony. Because he says, the Father in heaven testifies about me. And guess what? It's the same thing. It lines up. Even the law, which the Pharisees claim to be experts in, even the law, you go read in the Old Testament the law, and you'll see that the testimony of two or three people is true. And so Jesus stands and says, the Father testifies about me, and I testify about me, and it's true. It's only Christ. He's exclusive. He's the only light of the world, 
If you want to have life, you have to follow him. So whether you're a Jew or a Muslim or an atheist or a Buddhist or a Roman Catholic or a Baptist or this or that, it doesn't matter. Without Christ, you're walking in darkness. Period. Put whatever label you want. Without him, you're walking in darkness. Now listen to the master's words. He's the light of the world. Muslims and even Jews, I'm going to say it, don't worship the same God. Now you might say, okay, Muslims, sure, but Jews? Jesus said, you are of your father to devil, the, the devil. Who did he say that to? He said that to unbelieving Jews. You can't worship God and reject the son. If you reject the son, you reject the father. This is the testimony of the triune God. This is the testimony of Yahweh. Jesus is the light of the world, the only means, the only means of salvation in life. Verse 19 to, um, looks like 20 here. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. And so the Pharisees, they look at each other after they hear Jesus talk, and they look at Jesus and they say, okay, where's your father? He testifies about you, and, and you're saying this stuff. Well, where is he? Why don't you bring him here so he can testify? Where is he, Jesus, son of Mary? We know your mom. We know your dad. Joseph is your dad, but you're saying God is your dad. So where's he at? This is what Jesus does. He does this all the time, and week by week, I say it every week going through this book. He just ignores them. He ignores their question because their question is, it's stupid. <laughs> it's, it's just not intelligent. Very, very powerful debate, dialogue, tactic Jesus uses. He doesn't get off track. See, the question would get him off track and going down a rabbit trail, but he's not going there. He just sticks to his guns. He doesn't budge. Too many times when we get questions from unbelievers and, and opponents of, of, of the Lord, this, this stuff will throw us off. We fumble and we bumble to answer the questions. Like when the lady asked me about the genderless aliens, I didn't even go there. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. I told her what matters is this, the justice of God. See, you're not going to hell because you didn't accept Jesus. You're going to hell because of justice, because you've sinned against the, the, the holy God of the universe, and he must do justly, but he's given you a way out in pouring his wrath upon Jesus Christ to, to bring justice uh, to, the, to the sin committed and forgiveness to you. But if you reject that, then justice has to fall on you. Who cares about genderless aliens? It's the gospel. Jesus doesn't go there with them because it's irrelevant. The question wasn't even legitimate. It's like asking, you know, when did God begin? He didn't begin. He's always been. Why, or, or asking, so why is red blue? It's not. It's red. The question's not legitimate. It's nonsensical. So Jesus looks through, through their questions. He looks through them, and he knew it was a waste of time to try to explain where his father was. They already knew. He knew that wasn't the issue. The issue was his identity. That's the question they should have asked. If Jesus says his father is in heaven, then that's a clear claim to divinity. That was the real issue here, was his identity, who he's saying, who he's saying he is. But they were blind. They couldn't comprehend that Christ claimed divinity multiple times already at this point. I mean... We're only in chapter 8, but go through the first seven chapters and you'll see almost every chapter he's claiming divinity. He's saying, I'm, I'm God. So Jesus says, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Speaking of Oprah, in an interview with her, a uh, popular pastor, uh, pastor, Joel Osteen, was asked, are there many paths to God? Oprah asked him, are there many paths to God? To which uh, Mr. Osteen responded, he said, well, I believe, Oprah, I'm not going to try to do an impression, because I'm not going to. Well, I believe, Oprah, that Jesus is the way to the one God, but I believe there are many paths to Jesus. Kind of vague, you know. Later, Oprah asked him, will gay people be accepted into heaven? 
To which she responded, Oprah, I believe they will. Why am I telling you this? Because Jesus said to the mainline religious leaders of his day, you know neither me nor my father. They didn't know him then. They still don't know him now. You see what our Lord is doing here? He's drawing a line in the sand. Are there many paths to the one God? Are there many ways to the Father? Jesus says, nope. There's only one. Are there many paths to Jesus? I suppose it depends how you interpret that. I got to Jesus in one path. You got to Jesus through another. But we both got to the same Jesus. But there's only one way to the Father. That's through Jesus. If you don't know the Son, you don't know the Father. It doesn't matter what religion you are or how you identify. It doesn't matter if you know all the religious lingo. No Son, no Father, no hope. Period. And people like Oprah and the New Agers of the world love to talk about the one God, this mysterious thing, this, this energy or whatever the heck they, uh, they define it as. They even quote the Bible and they think they're like so woke, like, hey, oh, oh, Jesus, yeah, yeah, I love Jesus, but I love Krishna and Allah and Buddha and I love everybody. Well, he doesn't give you that option. He says, if you, if you love me, you keep my commandments. You can love Allah and Buddha and Krishna, but you can't love Jesus at the same time. If that's the case, then you know neither the Jesus or the Father. As a matter of fact, if that's the case, you actually, the Bible tells us, you actually hate the one God that you claim to know. I remember before I got saved when I was a, I used to be a new ager. I'm going to confess, I used to be a new ager. I used to have this quote from Jesus on my wall. I printed it out in like Comic Sans, like a really cheesy font. And I put it on my wall. And the quote was, the kingdom of heaven is within you. I had that truth. That's a true statement. I had that taped on my wall. But I could not have been farther from the kingdom than I was then. Why? Because I thought Jesus was revealing a universal truth. And this is what I thought he said. I thought he said, you are God. I thought I was God. I thought that within me was this divine seed that if I could just unleash it by decalcifying my pineal gland or something, that I could somehow unleash this thing and I could have all my heart's desire. I'm God. Money and fame and cars and houses, everything that my black covetous heart lusted for, I could have it because I'm God. The truth was, the kingdom of hell was within me, not the kingdom of heaven. And the reason that was so was because the Jesus I quoted, I didn't know. And it's, it's no wonder that I replaced the worship of the true God with worship of myself then. There's a lot of messed up stuff in this world, but one thing that breaks my heart the most is knowing that there are literally millions of people, probably maybe even billions, with the name of Jesus on their lips and hell in their hearts. It's frightening, it's scary to know that most of these people will die and they will go to hell. While they skip about through life thinking they know him, they don't. These will stand before this blazing fire, the Son of God, read about him in Revelation, and hear him say bone-chilling words, and, and, which will echo through their souls through eternity. Depart from me, I never knew you. This is why we need to be lovingly bold. We can't just pat the Joel Osteens of the world on the back and say, oh, isn't it wonderful that we can all get to God through different paths? No, that's not loving. That's hateful. There's only one path to, the, to God. It's through Jesus and him alone. I know many, many people are going to hate you for saying that. Maybe some of you don't like me very much right now for saying that. But you know what? I have to s just say what the Lord says. That's what he said. And I always have to laugh when people say, Alan, you're not being Christ-like. Dude, I quoted Jesus. I didn't make this up, man. <laughs> he said it, not me.
many will have their pride inflamed and they're going to rail at you saying, look, you're what's wrong with Christianity. Stop judging me. You have sin too. He said it, man. You know, the person at Street Help I was talking to was telling me about how she's offended because I keep referring to God as him, using masculine pronouns. And I just said, I said, listen, I don't mean any disrespect at all, but that's what Jesus said. I'm just saying what he said. He called God Father. He used that word. He used that word, Jesus. I'm not going to edit his words to caress your, you know, sensibilities. Jesus is the light of the world. You identifying with a denomination means nothing. Like if you say I'm Baptist or I'm, or I'm Catholic or I'm Pentecostal or I'm this or I'm that, it means nothing. People will say all the time, oh, Jesus, uh, yeah, I know Jesus, I'm Catholic. Oh yeah, I know Jesus, I'm this or I'm that. No, it doesn't matter. What we ought to say is, oh, I know Jesus because he saved my wretched soul. <laughs> that's, why, that's how I know Jesus because his light shone on me and I looked at, at, the, at the light and I went, ugh. That's ugly. And then he saved me. But Jesus is the light of the world. And he was not finished sharing loving and hard truths. He continues in verse 21 all the way to, uh, let me just make sure I get it right. I think verse 24. Yep. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will, not, and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Yikes. <laughs> where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below, and I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So, Jesus is alluding to his death and his resurrection here. He's going away. Then they're going to seek him, and then they're going to die in their sins. Like, guys, try to comprehend this. They misunderstood. They heard that, and they thought, is he going to kill himself? <laughs> Are you kidding me? It's hard to determine the tone here, okay? Um, to me, it seems like this is sarcastic. It, it just seems that way. According to the first century Jewish, Jewish worldview, suicide co-signed a person to the lowest parts of Hades. That's what they believed, okay? So why would Jesus, a very Jewish teacher, healer, prophet, from their perspective at least, why would he say, you know what, guys, I'm just going to go and kill myself, and then you're also going to die in your sins too. Bye. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Look, they probably wanted him to kill himself. But regardless of the tone they, they spoke in, one thing is clear, they just didn't get it. So as often Jesus does, he corrects their misunderstandings. He, he sets the line in the sand again. Look, guys, you are from below. You are flesh. You are worldly. But I'm not. I'm from above. I'm not of the flesh. I'm not of the world. But wait, wait, wait a minute. Is, is Jesus judging them here again? That's not very nice. <laughs> Didn't Jesus get the memo that you catch more bees with honey than salt? He, did he miss that email in his junk box or something? Didn't Jesus know that judging people will only push them farther away from him? Obviously not, because he goes on to say, I told you you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Three times in these verses he says, you will die in your sins. Three times. So hold the presses. Did Jesus just say, unless you believe I am he, that is Messiah, God in the flesh, you will die in your sins? Did Jesus just tell a group of very learned religious leaders that unless they believe that Jesus is who he says he is, they would all go to hell? Is that what he just said? Yes. That's what he just said. That's literally what he just said. But I thought he was the light of the world. This isn't very, being very loving. Is it? 
This is what our shallow North American Christianity would say to anybody who spoke this way. And this is why I, I said, and I've said before, if Jesus came to speak in most of our churches, he would be kicked out for not being wise enough. But know this for certain. Part of being the light is speaking hard truths. Remember when I said light is offensive? Especially if you've been, especially if you've been spending your whole life in darkness, then light comes, my goodness, of course it's going to be offensive. Of course you're going to rail against it because you've been in the dark your whole life and now he's exposing what's there and it's ugly. Boldness, truth, and love don't have to be enemies anymore. They don't. Now, look, I'm not a proponent of polygamy. And you guys know what polygamy is? Having multiple wives and stuff? I I don't support that. But this morning, I want to perform a polygamous marriage, okay? Hear me, hear me, before you throw the tomatoes. I want to marry boldness to truth and to love. Three, three things. I want to marry them together once and for all so we can know we can be bold, we can speak the truth, and we can be loving at the same time. They should not be divorced or separated. You know why? Because in the perfect because in the person of Christ, the perfect sinless one, we see all these things united and married together. Perfectly. Maybe the only perfect polygamous marriage you'll ever see is found in Jesus with boldness and truth and let's add compassion and let's keep adding these things, but they're all in there in one person. Now of course, this needs to be said, we can be jerks too. I get that. There's a difference between speaking in boldness and love and compassion and just being a plain old jerk. There's a difference there. There's a way to be bold and loving and truthful without being a deliberate jerk. Now, I get that you can't do things perfectly and people will still perceive you as a jerk even if you do things in boldness and love and truth. People will still perceive you that way. But if we're honest, sometimes, you know, we've shared hard truths with a heart and intention of just being a jerk. You know, so, sometimes, that, you know, I've done that. And, and I had to repent from that. Now, hearts, our hearts need to be broken, and from the brokenness, that will inform our truth-telling. You get what I'm saying? Our, 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 our informing them that they're deceived, that you know, without Christ, there's no hope, should be done out of a heart overflowing with love for them, not a heart to be a jerk. All too often, it's done out of the uh, kind of vindictive heart. So we need to kind of soften our hearts and be committed to the truth, regardless of how you'll be perceived. Like when I talk to that that individual at Street Help about whatever about the pronouns and stuff, you know, when she left, I was like, like my heart broke, man. I was like, man, like what a trivial thing to keep someone from Christ. You know, like what what sort of pain, what sort of you know, uh, um, stuff has this poor individual had to endure that got her to a position where that's what keeps her from Christ. The father, the, the, the fact of God as father is keeping someone from Christ. Like, there's some serious stuff going on in the, in the background for that to happen. So we need to, to actually care about these people and love them enough to tell them the truth and not to back down even if they do get offended because what they need is truth, not a pat on the back. Truth with a pat on the back is nice too. But she, she wouldn't have appreciated that anyway. So. so even after Jesus had said all these things, they still didn't get it. And finally, they just ask him this. And I close with these passages here. Verse 25. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. Oh no. There it is again. I have much to say about you and much to judge. Oh my goodness. But he who sent me is true and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. 
By the way, isn't that interesting that he just blasted them and then many believe? The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. So he just flat out tells them, look, man, are you kidding me? You don't get it yet? I am the Savior, and I will be lifted up. He tells them, you guys are going to have me killed. And when that happens, then you'll see and know who I am. Jesus only does what pleases the Father, and it's obvious why, because he said in the opening phrase of this passage, he's the light of the world. And Jesus was always pointing back to himself, because truly, he's one with the Father, and all who believe in him will walk in the light of life. And again, the function of light is to expose. It's really the only function of light, isn't it? To expose what's in the darkness. Now, that word expose has some negative connotations, but we need to think of it as positive because we need to expose what's in the dark lest we trip and break our necks. Exposure is a good thing. The truth will set you free. What does it say? Yeah, that's next week. <laughs> but no, isn't it interesting that that verse is immediately after what Jesus just said? It's, it's no coincidence. Why would somebody hate a person who comes with light? Because what they know is in the dark is shameful and wrong. That's why. Because if what was done in the dark is wonderful and beautiful, then you would, yeah, expose this. Put it on Facebook. <laughs> Yeah, why not? It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> Hence why Jesus comes on the scene. That's why he was hated. He was hated for who he fundamentally was, light. Right. You get that? He was hated because his very presence exposed everyone as sinners. What Jesus' words in ministry tell us very loudly is, if sinful humanity could, they would kill God. That's what they did, isn't it? They killed him. Now, joke's on them because he came back to life. <laughs> he didn't stay dead. He did this with his own blood. He came to redeem us, to reconcile us to the God we hate. Isn't that just, sorry, isn't that just r ridiculous? Isn't that just wonderful? That while we were yet sinners, while we yet hated him, Christ came and died for us. That's when he did it. Don't run from the light. Be exposed. Embrace the exposure. It's our salvation. It's our hope. Jesus is the light of the world. He died. He rose from the dead to bring us back to the Father. He's the only way, Christ and Christ alone. So with that, we're going to remember his death and resurrection with communion. So if you could pass those around, that would be wonderful.